Jackson waving. Hey guys. Okay. Hi, I'm Maris Kreisman and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions, so start thinking about them now. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have, and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening, if not before. Um, we're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the evening, I'll post links in the chat to buy Justine from McNally Jackson. And we're so thrilled to be able to celebrate the launch of Forsyth Harmon's wonderful illustrated novel. Um, here she is. Uh, Forsyth Harmon is the author and illustrator of the illustrated novel Justine. She's also illustrating Melissa Phoebus's forthcoming essay collection, Girlhood. She illustrated The Art of the Affair with Catherine Lacey, and she's also collaborated with writers Alexander Chi, Hermione Hobie, and Leslie Jameson. Her work has been featured in The Believer, Tin House, Virginia Quarterly Review, and The All. She received both her BA and MFA from Columbia University. And joining Forsyth tonight is Kristen Radke, who is the author of the graphic nonfiction book, Imagine Wanting Only This. The recipient of a 2019 Whiting Creative Nonfiction Grant, she's the art director and deputy publisher of The Believer. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Marie Claire, The Atlantic, and The Guardian, among many other publications. And I will also put a link in the chat to pre-order her new book, Seek You. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you so much, Maris, and thanks everyone so much for coming. I, I really appreciate it. I know um, some of you were on Zoom a lot, and so to spend a little bit more time on Zoom means a lot to me today. Um, if you feel like throwing on your cameras, I encourage it. Sometimes, um, you know, seeing others is a part of the reading. Um, but don't feel like you need to if you don't feel like your writing is uh, your lighting is right. Um, I'm just really happy that everyone's here, um, and thanks so much. Kristen, um, for being here as well. Um, <clears throat> we'll <laughs> thank you. Um, we'll start out with just a brief reading, um, and then we'll go into the Q and A. <clears throat> um, before I go ahead and, and start reading, um, and I'll just do that for about five minutes, um, because the novel is illustrated. Um, I thought I would share with you what some of the images looked like, so you can bear that in mind as I read. Um, I'll be reading from the beginning of the book, so I'm just going to go ahead and share um, the images from some of the first pages of the novel. <clears throat> um, each chapter has a full page frontispiece like this one, which opens chapter one. Um, but as you move through, um, you'll see um, that uh, the text appears much as it does in a traditional uh, novel uh, throughout. Um, but then you'll also see um, some incidental imagery uh, or illustrations um, appear uh, on and off through the pages. Um, so that should give you a good sense of the visuals. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just read for a couple minutes from the first pages um, before we start talking through the questions. I first saw her on the other side of the conveyor belt. She was so tall and thin, she looked almost two-dimensional, her long fingers fluttering over the cash register keys, her long arms passing my trident sugar-free gum and Diet Coke over the sensor. Her own can of Diet Coke sweated a ring on the countertop beside her. Her face was long, too, and her skin was so pale it was bluish like skim milk and transparent in places veins visible at the temples. Her complexion created an unsettling contrast with her hair, 
which was cut into a chin length pitch black bob. She pulled at the ends of it with those long white fingers, shoving the hair into her mouth wide and protruding as though closed around the rind of an orange slice. But her eyebrows were so light, they were almost non-existent. And I could see then that her inch long roots were an ashy color, dull as dishwater. Most girls would have highlighted hair that color, made it blonder, but Justine went dark. There was something spooky about the lighter roots. There was something spooky about Justine altogether. That's what the name tag attached to her red stop and shop apron said, Justine. She must have gone to the other high school, the nicer one, the next town over. Two dollars. Justine looked at me and smiled a wide, bright, dazzling smile. It was like the whole supermarket went silent when she smiled. There was a pause in the fitful beeps of scanned barcodes. The tinny music faded away. Her smile lit me up and exposed me all at once. Justine was a light shining on me and the dark shadow it cast. And I wanted to stand there forever in the relief of that contrast. I handed her the money and when the tips of my fingers brushed the soft inside of her wrist, my body went hot. It was a heat I didn't feel when I was with Matt. I felt it from the inside. It overwhelmed me. I tried not to show it. I grabbed my gum and soda. Posters covered the windows. Sprite lemon lime soda, 12 pack, 349. Bobily original pizza crust, two for five. Admitting natural light in only a few narrow slices. I saw a help wanted flyer, not far from the automatic doors, just above the gumball machines. A woman with long hair parted down the middle was stationed at customer service. From afar, I wasn't sure what it was about her that scared me. But as I got closer, I realized it was her face, how hairless and smooth it was, deleting any indication of age. She could have been 30 or 50, and for some reason that frightened me. Her name tag said, Teresa. I'm here about the job. I had to look up at her. The kiosk was raised, giving her a queenly altitude. She was counting postage stamps, mouthing 10, 11, with maroon-lined lips. She didn't acknowledge having heard me at first, finally raising her brows, which were entirely penciled in. I don't think there was a single actual hair and handed down a piece of paper and a pen from her little window with a sigh, like I was really putting her out. The counter was too high to use as a writing surface. I had to use a tide box at the top of a pyramid shaped detergent display. I suspected she liked that, seeing me slightly compromised. I scribbled down my information and handed the form back up to her. She snatched it with a French manicured hand and I saw beneath her three quarter sleeves that her arms were hairless too, luminescent. She cradled a receiver between her shoulder and ear. Michelle to customer service. Her voice sounded nasal over the intercom, more South Shore Long Island than North. She examined the application looking from it to me then back at it again with a seriousness that felt disproportionate to the job. Fine, Teresa glared, snapping the paper into a three ring binder. And so I secured a place for myself in Justine's glittering vicinity. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to hear you read that out loud. Forsyth. Thanks, Chris. We're doing it all in the same space. Yes. Um, but I love this book so much that I made it my back on. <laughs> but I, um, you know, I, I, we got to know each other at, at, through your illustration. Um, I work at the Believer magazine and you made a um, series for uh, that ran through the course of the magazine. Some of the images actually ended up appearing in this book yes. or versions of them did. Um, and so I'm curious about, you know, one of the things I love about your drawings is that they have a real visual voice to them in the same way that your, um, in a, you know, in a similar way that your prose has a voice. And so I'm curious about how, um, how you can, if you can talk about like the process of illustrating the book and how you, like, did you imagine it always as an illustrated novel? Mm, yeah, I love that question to start with. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I've always illustrated my writing. Even as a kid, I illustrated a series of girl detective books um, and uh, was a maker of zines as a teenager. 
Um, and I did intend um, an illustrated project. Um, the book started as a short story, um, but I was encouraged um, by the excellent Ed Park, um, for those who know him, um, that it might um, you know, be able to expand into a novel. Um, and so I began to um, both uh, extend the length and also um, add uh, full color watercolor illustrations, which is the medium I was most often working in at the time. Um, uh, and sort of, you know, through a process of revision, um, the writing became more and more um, economical, uh, I think the, is the word I would use. Um, and so too, um, I redrew the illustrations uh, in this black and white style in order to align with the prose style. Um, in terms of voice, um, you know, I got some flack, I would say, from early readers um, about the lack of interiority that mm -hmm. Ali offers. Um, and, you know, at times during their vision process, I sort of attempted to add it. Um, and yet it never quite felt honest. It, it felt mm -hmm. injected. Um, and so sort of as I moved forward, I started to see that perhaps the illustrations um, could act as a kind of extension of my narrator, Ali's interiority. Um, she struggles to communicate, um, but perhaps the images could do a bit of that for her. Um, and so that was some of my um, intention behind both how I drew the images and what I drew. Um, in addition to also um, cementing us um, in a time and a place, right? So the yeah. book takes place in the summer of 1999 on Long Island. Um, and so I was looking also um, to use the images that way. And it, there's, there is a sense of a lot of the images that things are kind of like breaking apart or there's, it's like kind of showing like how things were made. Do you feel like that kind of mirrors uh, some of the themes of the book? I do, um, you know, I think adolescence is, a time of great change and transformation. There is a butterfly that appears at a certain point, right? Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, the narrator is also, um, I think, going through a difficult period um, and, um, you know, struggles to express that. Um, although I think that, you know, these successions, particularly of images, um, try to do some of that work. So, for instance, like conversely, I mentioned the butterfly, you know, over a period of a couple of pages, the, the butterfly opens its wings, you know, at a point when Ali is is growing warm to to the title character, Justine, um, you know, but but later on, she has a confusing intimate experience and we have both a cassette tape unraveling and a measuring tape unraveling. Um, and, you know, there's a point when we think, you know, she should probably have a good cry um, you know, but is unable to do that and, you know, a piece of loose leaf crumples. Um, but, you know, you're right throughout, um, if you think of, um, there's an illustration of a bag of Lay's um, or uh, a bit earlier on of a Hershey's wrapper, they're all sort of, <laughs> a lot of consumer products sort of being crumpled. Um, and I do think that, you know, that represents Ali's emotional experience. Definitely. So as uh, Forsyth and I are talking, I'd love to know what y'all are thinking about and what questions you have. So feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll um, ask some of those questions throughout the course of our conversation to kind of make this more collective rather than just waiting until the end. So please do use the chat. Um, so you mentioned, you know, like the, the time of adolescence and how it's a lot of change. You know, teenage girls are very uh, complicated animals. You know, I'm curious about how you kind of put yourself back in that place and how you kind of embodied um, that time again. Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked about that. Um, and I felt a kind of calling to return to that time. Um, I feel like um, I perhaps didn't process some of the experiences at the sort of the first go. Um, and actually felt an urgency to, to return to and re-examine it. Um, in terms of taking on the teenager's perspective, you know, it's possible that, you know, when I started it, I had the emotional intelligence of a teenager. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I did, you know, 
look through old photographs and, you know, access early diaries um, and also read a lot of writing narrated by teenage narrators. Um, and two, in terms of being specific to that time, also did some research just in terms of culture. Um, you know, just because I lived through 1999 once doesn't mean I, you know, had sort of crystal clear clarity um, in terms of, you know, um, what exactly everyone was listening to um, or watching or doing. Um, and so I also spent some time listening to music and sort of looking back at the films of the time. Um, mm -hmm. The indie films, especially, which I think um, uh, inspired sort of the aesthetic a bit and, um, you know, some of the voice and maybe some of the disconnectedness of the scenes. Like if you think of like Hal Hartley films um, or sort of the golden age of 90s indie cinema, um, you know, I spent some time with that as well. So you mentioned that you were reading a lot of um books about teenage girls or narrated by teenage girls I do the same thing when I'm writing it's really hard for me to like to to write unless I'm about a specific sort of moment unless I feel like I have some like models or books I can be in conversation with did you um were there any in particular that were particularly impactful where you were writing the book um I'll say like Megan Abbott's entire of mm -hmm. I'm just I'm I just love Megan Abbott um like her combination of sort of looking at teen girl experience and from this sort of through this noir lens I find like really inspiring um like I think yeah. of her work and it's like it's like this candy coated razor blade sort of um and so while I did look at a lot of classics you know like Laurie Moore um, or a more contemporary work like Robin Wasserman's Girls on Fire. Um, I found myself like really settling into Abbott and, and really surveying her work in a more methodical way. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, Monica would like to know, um, uh, Monica doesn't totally agree that there is a lack of uh, interiority, um, but they would like to know, uh, we, we learned so much about who she is through her obsessive seeing and observing, but especially in the last pages when there is a series of catastrophic events, no spoilers, we won't say what, uh, <laughs> I feel like it works in a super climactic way, like the story gets taken over by stark disconnected images. Uh, were you influenced by film? Did you think of any specific films when you were writing the book, especially the last scenes? Yeah, thank you. I was influenced by film and um, and thank you, Monica, for the question and thank you for being here. Um, uh, especially as I mentioned, 90s indie films. Um, the film that I was most um, influenced by um, was Larry Clark's Kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought a lot about this book um, as sort of a book about the kids who watched kids. Um, so if you've seen the 95 um, Larry Clark film, it follows um, some teenagers in the city, uh, in New York City, um, and sort of their, uh, you know, disastrous uh, <laughs> uh, exploits. Um, and yeah, I remember being in the theater in 1995, you know, sitting and watching that film and thinking like, ooh, like it was like a gut punch. Um, and it stayed with me. Um, and, you know, I do think that, yeah, it, it informed, um, the way that I approached, um, this novel and how I thought about it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll preface this question by saying, I think it's a frustrating question and I hate <laughs> it when people ask it, especially of women, of women fiction writers, because I feel like it comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, right. Like the, one of the most questions about curi it, that people are most curious about is like, what's, was any of this influenced by your own experience, you know, but I have heard you talk a lot about auto fiction mm -hmm. and I'm curious, you can feel free to completely dismiss the question if you agree that it's annoying, but I'm curious about, um, if you want to talk about kind of the role of auto fiction at all. Yeah, I do. And, and I'm glad you asked, um, when I first um, you know, became serious about writing. I tried both fiction writing and memoir um, and was really intrigued in particular by um, a book that I think was published in 2001 um, by Lauren Slater called Lying. Mm -hmm. um, and she called it a metaphorical memoir. Um, that, that was before, you know, auto fiction um, appeared as a term, right? And I remember being really intrigued by that, that, you know, the facts of her book were untrue. 
yet mm -hmm. she felt uh, physically, and yet she felt that they were more emotionally true um, for her than her actual life. Um, and, you know, I, I was inspired by that. And two, also um, Alexander Cheese, of course, um, you know, title essay of his collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Memoir. Um, you know, he, he talks specifically about sort of looking at the shape of your experience or the story you want to tell, and then creating a kind of translation um, that is true to the shape of your story, um, but different in detail. Um, and that really resonated with me. And I found that by, you know, keeping sort of the uh, emotional truth, but shifting some of the circumstances wound up having that same kind of feeling for me of, yeah, that's how it felt. Um, even yeah. if that wasn't necessarily exactly how it was. Um, you know, that said, I did grow up on Long Island, um, you know, around the time that the novel is portrayed. Like I did, you know, have in fact more than one um, obsessive relationship with a female friend <laughs> over the course of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I did um, have a grandmother who differs not at all from the grandmother uh, depicted uh, in this book. Um, and so there's also, you know, there is quite a lot of autobiography. Um, but yeah, there's something that felt like magical and alchemical about that process of translation um, into fiction. That's really interesting, this idea of like a sort of like a emotional truth or something like that. The, the landscape photographer Ansel Adams talks about how one, in one of his first famous photographs, he manipulated it a lot in the camera and made the sky kind of darker than the landscape. And he said that it was the only way that he could get the landscape to look like how it felt, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so Diana uh, says that Diana loves the book, of course. Um, in Justine, you describe silence, repression, and the failures of communication, as in Allie's conversations with her grandmother. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the choices and challenges involved in representing those gaps in language. Yeah, thank you, Diana. Um, yeah, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I did get some flack for, you know, wanting my readers to read between the lines, um, you know, early on. And, you know, some of that I think was just, you know, I had an intention, but not the skill to execute on it. Um, and, and hopefully that improved over time. Um, but, you know, I, I love like a read that, you know, asks the reader to sort of meet it halfway there and, and fill in the blanks. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, the, biographical or autobiographical you know reasons like yeah i i did grow up with a grandmother who maybe wasn't like that well equipped and equipped in terms of her communication skills and you know i did use her to set a kind of a kind of tone in the book um that i then had to sort of work through in terms of you know well how do we how do we communicate without talking right um yeah. you know i'd mentioned being really inspired by the writer megan abbott in terms of how she deals with teenage girls um I really looked to Kazuro Ishiguro um, for sort of the restrained narrative. Um, and a lot of you probably know, we shared a pub date on March 2nd. His new book, Clara and the Sun, um, is out. That was very exciting for me. He's sort of he's my favorite writer. Um, it's but so I funny. There, there are two, I have two books on my desk right now. And they're, oh, it's, you yes. can't see, but they're the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me so happy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, most um, readers uh, or, or film viewers will be familiar um, with uh, Remains of the Day uh, and Mr. Stevens. Um, but, you know, I also think about his narrators in A Pale View of Hills and Artists of the Floating World um, as, you know, these sort of like self-deluded narrators who really struggle with sort of communicating and, you know, he has this really beautiful way of, you know, uh, sort of not putting everything down on the page. And yet, like, it's no, it's, the struggle is no less deeply felt. Um, and the way he kind of unravels those narrators over the course of, um, over the course of the book, I just find to be, like, really exquisite. Um, and I aspire um, to that skill. Well, I think that, you know, the way you, like the idea of like not telling the whole story also invites the reader to participate a little bit, 
I think. And I feel like that Justine is a very participatory novel. Like there's a lot of space for the writer to kind of live in, alongside it. Was that something you kind of thought about was like the- I, um, I did. Sort of, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that, that question. Um, and I've found that, you know, readers have come to it and, and gotten different things about it. Um, you know, I've had interviewers um, whose first questions were about like the repressed queerness of the book and interviewers who didn't mention that at all. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of depending on, you know, the point of view that they were coming from. Um, yeah, I like a I like a challenge. Um and you know, I did I did think of that as I was as I was writing the book. Um so yes. What role do you feel like queerness plays in the book for you? Yeah. Um you know, um, as one reads, um, one will notice that Ali has um, like strong uh, physical attraction to the title character, Justine. Um, you know, it's described in a few different places, um, but she does not allow herself to think past her physical response or examine it in any way. Um, and, you know, in one reading um, involves herself with another male character, Ryan, you know, potentially as sort of a safer receptacle for her attraction, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's a character she probably never would have met, um, you know, without knowing Justine. Right. Um, you know, um, she's growing up in 1999. I mean, that's 15 years before gay marriage is legal mm -hmm. in the United States um, and in a really conservative Long Island suburb. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, would the story have gone differently if it were to happen now? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but let's, yeah. Let's talk about Long Island because I feel like Long Island really becomes kind of a character in the, in the book. Can you kind of in the same way that I think like the late nineties does mm -hmm. um, kind of like, how did you realize both of those things through writing them? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, as I mentioned, I did grow up in that time and place, um, but it's so difficult to sort of see the thing you're living in and breathing. Um, and so it was interesting to revisit um, that time in that place. Um, in particular, you know, with the book coming out this year, it was really impossible not to think about the politics of the place. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Suffolk and, and Nassau or Nassau and Suffolk counties uh, in that order are the two richest counties um, in the whole country to have voted for Trump in, in 2020. Um, and, you know, I, I just I didn't have any um, political awareness at all um, growing up. It, it wasn't something that, um, you know, I I looked at. Um, and so I think just sort of thinking about the politics and how they might shape a young woman, um, you know, how they might shape a young woman who has an attraction to another young woman. Um, also, um, you know, how it might feel to grow up in a place um, where, um, you know, displays of material wealth are applauded, um, but like class is not outwardly discussed. Mm -hmm. um, was also a question on my mind um, as I was writing it. Um, and while Ali doesn't necessarily have the tools or the language to um, to ask those questions or, or, or explore that, um, I did try and do some of it with sort of the images and the attention yeah. to, to brands and spending a lot of time in the, the mall and <laughs> the supermarket, um, sort of these places of consumption, essentially. Yeah which is what teenage girls do. It, it is a sort of like, I think teenagers of all, eight, eight, of all genders are like, there is something about cons like consumption and commodity that is like kind of very central to kind of you're figuring out like how you how you fit or interact with the world. Hmm. Yeah, I don't um, know if that's, I don't even know if that's changed for me ever. I'm still, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still so figuring that one out. <laughs> a lovely comment from Leslie in the chat. Um, Love the idea of a narrator unraveling or getting unraveled across the course of the book. Also love the idea of restraint as something invitational rather than withholding. So we talked a little bit about, you used the word economical, which I love. Um, 
I'm curious if you can talk about like this is a bit like this is a very brief book and I'm like very short, but it covers a lot of, you know, a pretty big emotional expanse. So I'm wondering if you could talk about the experience of writing, of, of trying to fit so much into such a small space. Like I know you're and actually you've kind of conceived of this as a trilogy. Maybe you could talk about um, both of those things. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I I find real pleasure in um, economy. Um, mm -hmm. when it comes to writing. Um, I've, I've loved poetry um, and spent a lot of time in the readings downtown and in Brooklyn when such things were allowed. Um, and so there's inspiration there. Um, I know there are some poets here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, and, um, you know, I would also say, um, Yeah, um, I am looking at, um, this is the first of, of three books. Um, so um, specifically, um, I'm looking over the course of the three books to look at slices of life, um, sort of, you know, 10 years following this book, and then sort of 10 years following the next one. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I'm hoping, you know, I think maybe to go back to you know, Leslie's comment about like raveling or unraveling the character over periods of time um, to show how, you know, one character um, sort of maybe both changes and, and doesn't um, in these little sort of slices of life um, over the course of the three books. So what was, uh, what do you think motivated that idea about the trilogy? Like, what, is there something that feels like, like you're not, you're not quite finished with these characters yet? I think that's right. Um, and some of it also came like naturally through the process of, of um, one of the earlier revisions. Um, you know, there was a moment in um, my MFA, um, in fact, in my final thesis conference, um, where I turned in a version of um, this novel. Um, and, you know, a prominent novelist told me like, no, oh, no, throw out the images. This doesn't work. Sort of rewrite the whole thing as a traditional novel. And I was really crushed. Um, of course, um, but took the advice because this person was a genius um, and, you know, went ahead and extended the narrative um, further and further into time and, and looked at other parts of Ali's life and projected. Um, and ultimately that draft didn't work and I felt really strongly about the images being included. So I sort of went back to the original uh, material and, and reworked the images. Um, um, but then sort of saw this other material that had been generated in that previous um, draft and thought, oh, you know, there's something, I, I could do something with this. There's still some energy here. Um, and it was a really good lesson too, I think, as a writer and as an artist, because, you know, I'd sort of gone in this direction that felt maybe wrong and like a dead end and maybe a bit of a disappointment. Um, but then like later saw, oh, maybe there are no you know, there really are no efforts wasted. Um, there's something else that could be done here. Um, yeah. And there's more that could be explored. It is really part of the process, right? Like that throwing away, like you have to make something in order to know you need to throw it away and you had to make it in order to know kind of where the book needs to go. Yeah, and I also can't say how many times like I thought that this project was over and I was throwing it away yeah. and it was never gonna happen. Yeah. And in fact, I was never gonna write again. Um, yeah, I mean, it happened so many times um, over the period of working on it, and I'm sure it'll keep happening. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's a part of the process. Letting go is a part of the process. That's true. That's very relatable. Um, question from the chat. Uh, did you get pushback about including the illustrations? I feel like often something isn't, that isn't easy, easily categorizable makes people nervous. I wonder how early readers react to that or if agents or editors um, had any thoughts kind of when you were sharing it with them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I do feel really lucky to have um, gone through a graduate program, um, but I will say that, you know, there was no department that was built for image and text together, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I did have some really supportive instructors and I'm really grateful for that, but I also did spend a certain amount of time running up and down both the literal, uh, literal and metaphorical stairs between the art and the writing departments, right? <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it took the right editor and the right publisher 
um, to want to do a project like this. You know, I did admittedly get some rejections that just said, hey, we, you know, we think this is great, but we're not really sure to how to do it look like this. Um, yeah. So I feel really lucky and grateful for, for Tin House and for Maisie uh, Cochrane, my editor. Um, they've just been so amazing and, you know, are a press that just does, you know, so many great projects, um, you know, that are taking a risk or doing something a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, I think it's about finding the right home. Um, and so, you know, I, it was really gratifying to, to find that place and, and move forward with it, uh, with a team that, you know, understood, um, how to do it. And, you know, we're interested in taking a risk. Yeah. Do you think it's a risk? Did you, do you, did you feel like it was a, like, I'm curious because sometimes I feel like I get confused about that idea of like, that sort of, we don't know how to do this thing. Like sometimes I'm like, but it's a book, you know? Like sometimes I feel, I just feel so confused about that because it's just another, like, I feel like artists are just like, we all have to use the tools we have available to us. Like sometimes that's like, sometimes we can write poems, sometimes we can draw something, you know? So it's like, I, I feel like there's really no perfect medium for any project, we just use the tools we have. So to me, it feels so kind of not this, it feels so like such the, the natural, you know, way that it needs to be. Um, yeah. Well, you you're you're you do graphic narratives too, right? So <laughs> it would, that that would make sense. But I I think just maybe on a practical level, um, the production of a book mm -hmm. with images, um, yeah. the categorization and marketing of a book with images, the distribution, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just it might not fall exactly into um, the preset categories. Right. Um, and with this book too, you know, there's a little bit of like, well, it's not quite a traditional novel, but it's also not quite a graphic novel um, yeah. where there are images on every page or in the case of comics where you're following like a sort of cell-based format. Yeah. Um, and so it does fall a little bit in between categories. Um, much like teenage, not much like being a teenager. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so another question from the uh, from the room. Uh, sh this is from Leslie, who you have illustrated some of Leslie's work. Uh, as someone whose work you have beautifully illustrated, I'm so struck by the way that your visual gaze lights on particular details. I'm curious whether there are particular emotional experiences, states, or state changes that you find uh, it more intuitive to represent visually, and others that lend themselves more intuitively to language. Uh, how do they work together for you in representing feeling? Mm, that's really interesting. Um, I think in this book and in a lot of my work, um, I've fixated on the on the object or sort of a close up of an object as a way of sort of transferring emotion and and um, communicating emotion. So, you know, I mentioned um, a little bit earlier, especially in some of the sequences of objects, I'm kind of looking at small differences in the progression of an object um, mm -hmm. as a way to depict a feeling. Um, I think that will change over the course of the three books that I hope to publish. Um, you know, I thought in this case of these like black and white images at close range as being kind of representative of like Ali's ability to see the world. Like she doesn't have a ton of perspective, you know, you could hear like black and white thinking um, and, you know, is attached to these objects that are sort of like, you know, indicators of, you know, you know, like kind of nineties cult objects or, you know, potentially aspirational objects. Um, Whereas, you know, as I think forward, I might try using the images in another way. Um, like for instance, um, to represent, and this is a little bit more filmic, um, but like uh, repressed memories and mm -hmm. sort of traumas that begin to, um, repressed traumas and memories that begin to sort of surface um, as one's leading one's day-to-day -day life. Um, and so I imagine over the course of the three books that the images will take on a different function depending upon the piece of like Ali's interiority that I'm working on unraveling. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited about that, that it's, it's a fun challenge. So on this, we, we were sort of talking about, um, Leslie mentioned that you had, you had uh, illustrated her work. I'm curious to hear about, you know, the, 
was the you've illustrated a lot you've illustrated like uh, Catherine Lacey's work and Melissa Fibos work um many you know you've, you've done a lot of collaborations how how is the experience of drawing for your own like your own stories different from drawing others um yeah thank you all of the projects actually were really different in terms of mm -hmm. what the experience was like um so you know to think about the book projects in particular um you know working with Catherine Lacey on the art of the affair was sort of like a like a portrait production line I mean, yeah. we were looking at trying to draw about 150 different portraits for that um, for that book. And so, you know, that was a lot about that's flattening it a bit. It was a lot about execution, but also learning about the different artists, writers and musicians whose portraits I was drawing. Um, so, you know, there was sort of listening to their audiobooks in the background while I drew or to the music um, and sort of trying to absorb, you know, their histories and then regurgitate them through image uh, but there was like a kind of like check mark quality to it in terms of yeah. ticking through the list um you know if i think about um melissa phoebus's forthcoming essay collection girlhood um i drew a frontispiece um illustration for each of the eight essays um mm -hmm. and i was looking for each image to um, sort of represents the intention of the text that followed. Um, and so that process was different in that I was reading through her essays, almost sort of like sifting for gold, like, okay, what are the Im image symbols that could come up that I could then sort of put together to produce a frontispiece that sort of acted as like a kind of consolation um, that then um, communicated you know some of the intention behind the essay and then in thinking of all of those eight images together um you know that those then acted as sort of a greater constellation that represented some of the intentions of the book and i use the word constellation because she she talks about constellations quite a bit in the book um but yeah that was kind of a fun sort of like gold sifting experience so a bit different from Catherine's, um, you know, whereas in the case of this book and illustrating my own work, um, you know, I think as I described the process in response to your first question, there was quite a bit of back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately, I sort of understood what the jobs of the images were. Um, and once I understood that, that dictated sort of what was to be drawn, where it was to be placed, right. um, and how it was to be drawn. You mentioned the word, I think you said the word like it was just about execution. And I, I I really relate to that because I feel like I'm curious to hear about your process in drawing, because for me, it's like the creative challenges are arise before I begin drawing or when I'm like sketching something out or trying to figure it out. And after that point, it's just like, you know, it's just labor at that point. It's just like, you know, how long will it take me to produce this? Like, it feels like there's fewer creative discoveries for me to make once I start that process. Whereas like the act of writing is about still, like you're still trying to figure, like make sense of something. Even if you know, I have to write this scene, here's what needs to happen. But you're still like, kind of like, pe like figuring it out as you write. I'm, so I'm curious about- So true. Um, yeah. And I, I'm so grateful to have like, interest in doing both as a practice mm -hmm. because I find they really balance each other out so like like you said for me the writing is um even in edits like there there's a lot of exertion like a lot of right. mental and emotional exertion that goes into the writing um especially you know writing something that's partially autobiographical i'm sort of doing this like repressed trauma dredging thing where i'm you know going down and pulling it up and yeah. oh, what does this look like oh it's so ugly how do i make it beautiful um <clears throat> how do i make any sense of it um whereas um the drawing is a more like meditative exercise um and it becomes a time to reflect on like the dust I might have kicked up while I was writing. Interesting. Um, yeah, and it's maybe like a time to integrate whatever got sort of like um, fractured or, you know, like messed around with while I was writing. It's this time to sort of like settle down and integrate that. Um, it's like the quiet space or something. 
Yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of like um, mind activity going on. Um, it's more of like a kind of motor activity. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it, I think it, it keeps me, the two together, you know, keep things even. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think you, you touched on this a little, um, if, if there's anything you'd like to expand on, Michelle would like to know, um, how did it feel to locate much of the novel in a supermarket in Long Island? How did elements of class and work in everyday life relate to the story you're telling? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed setting it in a supermarket and actually another film that I was inspired by is like the nineties film go. I don't know who remembers that one with like Katie Holmes and Sarah Pauly. Um, working in a supermarket. Um, I, I wanna bring up, um, there's an incredible poem that some of you um, might know um, called Supermarket in California by Allen Ginsberg. Um, and it's addressed to Walt Whitman, who's also from Long Island um, and you know, sort of one of the great uh, poets besides Mar Mariah Carey and, and Billy Joel um, <laughs> of Long Island, right? Um, and you know, it's this incredible examination of sort of like what feels like the promise of bounty in the supermarket. Um, you know, there are the there are the pears and the peaches and you know this beautiful stacks of cans. Um, um, but you know, at the same time, and you sort of see this throughout, it's all under sort of neon lighting. Um, and you know, there's sort of this sense of you know nature or bounty being cut off from its source. Um, and, you know, I think I thought about locating, um, you know, much of the action in the supermarket with that same intention. Um, and then, you know, layering on top of it, the fact that, you know, the two girls, Ali and Justine featured in the book, like, don't really eat. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's like a little bit too obvious, um, you know, to put the, the eating disordered teenagers in the supermarket, but. There you go. <laughs> Maris, do we have time for one more question? Okay. So um, last question in the chat. Uh, I love how complicated and layered the friendship is between Allie and Justine. Their bond seems to grow more intense with their shared eating disorder. We were just speaking about this. Could you talk about their that aspect of this relationship and the intersection of food and love in your novel? Yeah. Um, and I'll answer that um, by, by mentioning another book that just came out recently that I love, which is Melissa Broder's Milk Fed, um, which you know shares a lot, I think, with this novel um, and does explore the intersection between like desire for love or desire for sex and desire for food. Um, and you know, I think coming of age is this time when you know our our body changes, our chemistry changes, we start to have these confusing desires um, and simultaneously um, the world um, in the case of teenage girls, you know, men, but not just men, women too, really start to, to treat one differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think for the narrator, there, there may have been this feeling of, you know, I'm just going to opt out of all of this. <laughs> this is, you yeah. know, there's this discomfort um, and maybe this sense that, you know, by not taking in food, um, there's an ability to sort of sidestep um, the passage into womanhood um, mm -hmm. from girlhood and all of its like ensuing burdens. Um, at the same time, you know, thinking about the link linkage between desires for food and sex, you know, if the narrator is experiencing a discomfort with, you know, desire for another woman, then, you know, turning off the food function, which simultaneously turns off the sexual desire function usually, right, um, is a, an efficient way to shut down both at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, female, female friendship in general, I think is such a complicated thing. I would say particularly in, in teenagehood, but actually I don't believe that. I think it is forever. I'm, and I, there, it hasn't been like a ton, you know, I think we talk sometimes about how there isn't like this huge, like kind of um, literary lineage of writing about female friendship. There are certainly some novels that do it extremely well, but it's not, uh, I think it's not written about in the same way that um, male friendships are. So I'm curious about like, was there something in particular that drew you to, to write um, kind of like this kind of complicated relationship or anything you really hoped to 
accomplish? Yeah. Um, I think that my, you know, friendships and, and my relationships with women have really like defined my life in a way. I mean, you know, my, my grandmother and also my mother were, you know, the two most important figures to me growing up. Um, and, you know, if I think through my adolescence and into my adulthood, in some ways it shapes itself into these discrete periods that are defined by the women with whom I'm closest. Um, and I would say that continues to be true today. Um, you know, there are friends or, or bosses or mentors um, who've meant a lot to me that, you know, I've learned so much from that have come to define me. Um, mm -hmm. And that becomes especially clear as I look back. And mm -hmm. I'm interested in that. Um, and, you know, maybe it was less hoping to accomplish something, um, you know, as it was hoping to understand something um, yeah. that, you know, I, I went into this project and, you know, continue to move through the next one. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask that we do this really cheesy thing, which is that if you feel comfortable, please turn your camera on. And I would love, I'm going to take a picture because if we were all in person, Forsyth would have this beautiful photo of all the people that she loves coming together. And let's get like some real enthusiasm going. That's so sweet. <laughs> Thank <picture>. you. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Okay. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Kristen. This was so fun. Forsyth, is there anything... Um, that I will okay so let's talk about the next book so when is what um kind of like what are you thinking about next what are you working on now um so I am working on a sequel to Justine um and it follows Ali um and looks at her life 10 years later um and for those of you who've already read the book um Nina um who's who's featured in this book becomes a character of interest uh, in the second. Uh, and so the fixation shifts from the one to the next. Um, so um, I'm still working on that manuscript, um, but I'm enjoying spending more time with the characters um, and hope that one day you'll get to too. Yeah. Um, it was such a pleasure getting to talk to you about this amazing book. I would just want to echo um, what Mara said at the beginning about the links in the chat to purchase it. Um, I've been hearing time and time again that um, when people come to virtual events, they don't always buy the book from the bookstore, but it's just as much work to put this on for them uh, in this virtual space as it is in person. So please do support McNally Jackson, which is an institution we cannot live without. So. That is so true. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you so much, Maris, for having us. It means a lot to me. McNally was like, you know, my number one choice for my launch. And so it meant so much for me to be able to have it here with you. It was our pleasure. Forsyth <clears throat> and Kristen, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who um, came out and um, have an excellent night. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations, Forsyth. Thank you so much, Kristen, for being here. It was great chatting with you. Thanks so Me much, too. everyone. <laughs>